From the church office building in Salt Lake City, we now introduce David O. McKay, President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Many people today, especially young people, are troubled with the apparent conflict between science and religion. To me, there has been no serious difficulty in reconciling the principles of true religion and true science. For both are concerned with the searching out the eternal truths of the universe. If man knew and understood all truth, he would find that there is no disharmony between the two. In the meantime, we shall continue our search for truth as a wise father has decreed to a great extent by faith. And the Lord God said, Worlds without number have I created, and by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. And as one earth shall pass away, and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come, and there is no end to my works. Far in the distant past, before time was, you and I and every person who has ever lived upon the earth dwelt in the presence of our Heavenly Father. There we grew in intelligence, saw worlds organized and peopled with kindred spirits. There we longed and prayed for the time when we could come to our own earth and take upon ourselves mortal bodies and be tried and tested in all things. And there stood one among them that was like unto God. And he said unto those who were with him, We will go down, for there is space there, and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. So somewhere amidst the galaxies and the stars, our solar system was organized, drifting on the edge of the great Milky Way like puffs of dust in the vast oceans of space. A sun and nine known planets. One of these planets was our Earth, a place where man could struggle and grow and seek for truth. In our search for truth, it must be remembered that the kingdom where God dwells is governed by laws which far transcend our laws. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In biology, we learn that all life eventually comes to an end in death. Laws of death pertain to this earth and came about through the fall of Adam. As a result of the fall, then, we are encompassed by sin, sorrow, corruption, and death. But where God dwells, there is no death, no sorrow, 
no evil, no corruption. And through Jesus Christ, the God, the light and the life of this world, who redeemed man from the fall, the way has been opened whereby we may overcome death and return to our Father in heaven. Eventually, our fallen world will become a celestial sphere and be governed not by earthly laws, but by laws such as those which govern our Father's sphere. The Lord, through his servants, has given us some guidance. But many things are left for man to ferret out for himself. This is as it should be, for this is all part of man's purpose for being here, that he may gain knowledge and discover truth. And the greatest truth that can be discovered is that God lives and that he did create our universe. Sir Isaac Newton, great physicist of the 17th century, had many arguments with an agnostic friend on whether the universe came about by chance or whether it came about by special creation. The story is told that one day... Dr. Newton, I have great news. The Paris Academy of Science has accepted my paper. I've been invited to read it at the Sorbonne. My congratulations. Thank you, Sir Isaac. Now tell me, what have you been doing since we last met? Or is it a secret? Oh, I have no secrets from you, my friend. But well, to tell you the truth, I haven't been making much progress in my experiments on the nature of light. Why, what have we here? It's a model of our solar system. How very interesting. Go on, turn it. It's perfectly harmless. How very ingenious. Why, this is the most marvelous demonstration of our solar system I've ever seen. Schoolboy would understand this. Where did you get it? Who made it? Nobody made it. I'm serious. Where did you get this? It's extremely clever. I'm serious too. This material just came together and assembled itself quite by chance. Of course you're not serious, Dr. Newton. You and I know that the chance formation of such a thing is a physical impossibility. At last. I've captured you in a web of your own making. See here. My friend, you admire this simple model I've made. Yes, I admit, I was its creator. This thing is a puny imitation of a much grander system with which you're already familiar. You mean our universe? Yes. Do you still think that this great universe, and this world of ours, and everything in it, came about by chance. For every effect, there's a cause. To conceive this universe in all its marvelous detail required a cause. An intelligence, if you wish, which understood and compared the quantities of matter in the sun and planets, and understood the gravitating force between the sun and planets. Now, to adjust all this so delicately in such a marvelous variety of positions argues the original cause to be not blind and fortuitous but extremely well-skilled in mechanics and geometry. I like to think of this cause as God. And today, too, men do not believe that order ever comes of itself. It takes intelligence to make and assemble the parts of an automobile, not to mention the miracle of the conception, birth, and organization of the extremely complex human body. This leads us directly to the same age-old controversy which confronts young people today, just as it did Newton. Did life on Earth come about by orderly creation, as the revelations of God declare? Or did life come into being spontaneously by the chance meeting of elementary particles and without a guiding intelligence, as put forth by some skeptics? This theory has become very widespread, but a majority of scientists are now firmly convinced that creation was directed by an intelligent being. For instance, Cressy Morrison, prominent scientific reporter, has given us an illustration which suggests this premise. 
Suppose that you put 10 pennies, marked from 1 to 10, in a piggy bank. Now try to get them out in sequence from 1 to 10, putting back the coin each time and shaking them all over again. Mathematically, your chance of getting out the one marked number one the first time is one in ten. The chances of shaking out one and two in succession are one in one hundred. The chances of shaking out one, two, and three in succession are one in one thousand, and so on. Your chances of shaking out all ten numbers in succession would reach the unbelievable figure of one in ten billion. Think of it. One in ten billion. By the same reasoning, there are so many exacting conditions necessary for life to exist on this planet that they could not possibly have come into the proper relationship by undirected chance. For instance, as Morrison also points out, the Earth rotates on its axis at 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, producing our days and nights of 24 hours. If the Earth rotated at only 100 miles per hour, our days and nights would be 10 times longer than they are now. During the day, the sun would likely burn up our vegetation, while during the long night, anything not destroyed by the sun would freeze. Again, the sun has a surface temperature of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and our Earth is just far enough away so that its fire warms us just enough and yet not too much. Could that be by chance? If the sun gave off only one half its present radiation, we would freeze. If it gave off half as much more radiation, we would roast. The earth is tilted 23 degrees and this gives us our seasons. Was this also by chance? And another thing, if our moon, instead of its actual distance of 238,000 miles, were only 50,000 miles from the Earth, the tides of the ocean would be so enormous that twice a day all of the continents would be submerged. Even the mountains would soon be eroded away. It is apparent from these and other examples that there is not one chance in billions that life on our planet is accidental. Dr. Edwin Conklin, Princeton University biologist, has compared the probability of the Earth being created by chance to that of the unabridged dictionary resulting from an explosion in a printing shop. Anyone for Scrabble? Many scientists of the 19th century were misled by certain of their observations, and as a result came to conclusions which were atheistic. But now even the most pragmatic materialist, in the face of present-day scientific knowledge, is led to the inevitable conclusion that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The first great principle of science is that all nature is orderly in its behavior and that it operates under a series of eternal, unchanging laws. Man has been able to duplicate some of the components of a simple cell, but even under the most favorably controlled laboratory conditions, a cell has never been observed to spontaneously come alive. In fact, if even the most simple cell in existence dies, we are still unable to bring it back to life. It's unimportant to know in exact detail how the earth and its life were created, for the Lord did it by means only dimly guessed by man as yet. But the important thing to know is that God is the creator, and that he lives and is interested in us. 
And this we may know. Most scientists today agree on this one great truth. There is a God. Listen to Dr. Armin J. Hill, Dean of Physical and Engineering Sciences at Brigham Young University, as he gives the views of world-renowned scientists on this subject. Acceptance of new information as it becomes available is the true scientific approach. When added knowledge points to new conclusions, a true scientist never hesitates to discard the old theory. In our world of research, it is to be expected that researchers will change their views and their conclusions as they develop new knowledge. It is no disgrace to change one's mind. By changing with newly acquired knowledge, science is able to advance. It has been so from the beginning. To illustrate this point, Sir James Jeans, British astronomer, has said, the new knowledge compels us to revise our hasty first impressions that we had stumbled onto a universe which either did not concern itself with life or was actively hostile to life. We now discover that the universe shows evidence of a designing and controlling power that has something in common with our individual minds. As Curtly F. Mather, Harvard geology professor, put it, that there is an administrator of the universe cannot be denied. The question, is there a God, is promptly and finally answered in the affirmative. Or as Dr. Robert A. Millikan, famous physicist on one occasion wrote, Nothing could be more antagonistic to the whole spirit of science than atheism. At another time, he said, I think you will understand me when I say that I have never known a thinking man who did not believe in God. Albert Einstein, speaking of the creator, calls him a master mathematician and adds, the harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. Dr. William F. G. Swan, international scientist and lecturer, bears this out when he says, the man of science likes to separate fact from speculation. Now viewing the universe as a whole, I cannot escape the fact that it is of intelligent design. The universe shows on a magnificent scale the same kind of interrelationship of its working and planning as an engineer strives to achieve in his own understandings. It is not so much the failure to comprehend the universe which fills the man of science with awe but rather the fact that in what he does understand, he sees a plan, not only akin to his own way of doing things, but one conceived with enormous cleverness. And so the man of science, conscious to some extent of how the thing is done, is much more impressed by the intelligent design of the universe than would be the unscientific man of past ages. A marvelous thing about the universe is the apparent simplicity of its fundamental design. It is the simplicity of the perfect genius. There are less than a hundred different kinds of atoms composing the variety of forms of matter known to our everyday experience. But even these are built according to a common plan out of but relatively few kinds of fundamental particles principle of which are only three different kinds, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. The laws governing the activities of these particles are relatively simple to the scientist. And yet out of these laws is fashioned all of the richness of nature. It is because of these laws of the universe, the laws of these fundamental particles, that we have light 
and mechanisms in our eyes to make use of it. It is because of them that we have been able to invent radar, later to find that the bat had used the same principle from time immemorial to enable him to fly with safety at night. It is because of these laws that the marvelous interrelation of organisms represented by our own bodies has become a reality. Still quoting from Dr. Swan, and yet all this superb cleverness is interlinked in a manner to excite the wonder of even the most exacting efficiency expert. These laws have brought colorful beauty to flowers and enticing scents that attract the insects and further the purpose of fertilization. For me, the profoundest meaning of religion is that it is a code of ethics draped about the personality, the image of an ideal being. Acceptance of the creator as a personal being is spreading rapidly as research continues. After describing the creator as an intelligent being, Dr. Arthur H. Compton, Nobel Prize winning scientist says, the intelligent God has an interest in and relation to man. And it is reasonable to assume that he would be interested in creating a being intelligent like himself. Where there is a plan, there is intelligence and an orderly unfolding universe testifies to the truth of the most majestic statement ever uttered. In the beginning, God. Scoffing at the idea that man is made only to die and lapse into annihilation and calling it an infinite waste, Dr. Compton goes on to say, I prefer to believe man lives on after death continuing in a larger sphere in cooperation with the maker, the work he has here begun. Now may I add my own observation that in the contacts I have had with many of the great scientists of this day, I have found most of them to be humble, sincere men with attitudes which are closely in harmony with those I have quoted here. Also, may I say that all I have observed in nature, all I have studied in the fields of science, has strengthened my own profound conviction that God lives and that what we see and experience as the physical world is his handiwork. The director of the George C. Marshall Space Flight Center at Huntsville, Alabama, Dr. Werner von Braun one of the world's foremost space authorities, expresses himself this way. Today, more than ever before, our survival, yours and mine and our children's, depends on our adherence to ethical principles. Ethics alone will decide whether atomic energy will be an earthly blessing or the source of mankind's utter destruction. Where does the desire for ethical action come from? What makes us want to be ethical? I believe there are two forces which move us. One is believe in the last judgment when every one of us has to account for what he did with God's great gift of life on the earth. The other is belief in an immortal soul, a soul which will cherish the award or suffer the penalty decreed in a final judgment. Belief in God and in immortality thus gives us the moral strength and the ethical guidance we need for virtually every action in our daily lives. In our modern world, many people seem to feel that science has somehow made such religious ideas untimely or old-fashioned. But I think Science has a real surprise for the skeptics. Science, for instance, tells us that nothing in nature, not even the tiniest particle, can disappear without a trace. Think about that for a moment. Once you do, your thoughts about life will never be the same. 
Science has found that nothing can disappear without a trace. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Now, if God applies this fundamental principle to the most minute and insignificant parts of his universe, doesn't it make sense to assume that he applies it also to the masterpiece of his creation, the human soul? I think it does. And everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. Nothing can disappear without a trace. Another eminent man of science, Dr. Harvey Fletcher, father of stereophonic sound, former director of physical research at Bell Laboratories, and professor emeritus at Brigham Young University, adds his testimony. I myself have a firm belief that God lives, and that life has purpose for each one of us living here upon Earth. I did not obtain that faith through scientific reasoning, but rather through spiritual experiences which are hard to explain to others, but nevertheless are very real. It's been my experience that a great many men of science believe in God. True religion never hesitates to be held up for investigation by men of science. This is uh, borne out by the large number of scientists who have been and are now members of our church. For example, such men as Arson Pratt, James E. Talmage, John A. Widso, and Joseph F. Merrill. And many eminent scientists outside our church, such men as Michael Faraday, Louis Pasteur, James Clerk Maxwell, Robert A. Millikan, Michael Pupin, all believed in God. Let me read to you the testimony of Michael Pupin. At the time this was written, he was president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Professor Pupin said, the real purpose of science is not merely to make material things, inventions to increase wealth and comfort. If science does not help to give me and others a better faith to live by, a better understanding of the Creator, a closer relationship to God, so that I can carry out the divine purpose, then science is a failure. The soul of man is the highest product of God's creative handiwork. Now, after God had spent untold time in creating man and endowing him with a soul, is it reasonable to suppose that man lives here on earth for a brief span and then is extinguished by death? That the soul perishes with the physical body? That it existed in vain? There's a growing tendency in this age to think that as one becomes mature, one must throw off a belief in God, just as one discards his belief in Santa Claus. Just where would such a position leave us? We would be forced then to admit that this beautiful world of ours was not the product of design and planning, but of mere undirected chance, that your dearest friend is simply a jumble of atoms and molecules that just happened to land together to make a dear and loving personality. I feel certain that in our quest for the mysteries of the physical universe, that the Lord will guide and direct us into new scientific findings. I also feel certain that if we search for a testimony with the same vigor and energy, that we will find that too. I have. Likewise, Dr. Henry Eyring, Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Utah and recently elected National President of the American Chemical Society says, 
There is no doubt in my mind that God lives. I've had no serious difficulty in reconciling the truths of science with the truths of religion. Moreover, God has instilled in us a desire to search after the truth. I'm thankful that I belong to a church whose doctrines can be subjected to every test. I remember hearing of a young man going to college who decided to study science. Gee, Annie, it's good to see you looking so well. Well, thank you, dear. Charles, it just doesn't seem possible that you're going to the university this fall. Well, after the summer I spent, it'll be a pleasure to work only 10 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, since your mother told me what you're going to study at the university, well, to tell you the truth, dear, it's worried me. Worried you? Why, Aunt Claire? Anthropology and biology are both real interesting fields. Well, I'm sure they are, Charles, but it's uh, just that becoming a scientist, I, well, I'm afraid you'll lose your faith that you might become a materialist or an agnostic. Oh, Auntie, I'm sure that my faith in a creator is more deeply rooted than that. Well, I don't know. They say some of those men at the university don't believe in the Bible at all. Charles, dear, it isn't too late to reconsider your course of study. To this well-meaning relative, as to many other people, science and religion seem to be opposing forces. To embrace one is to give up the other. In contrast to this advice, which Aunt Claire gave Charles, I recall the advice my father gave me as I left to study my freshman year at the University of Arizona. Hey, Dad, huh? isn't it about time? Yeah, let's see. That afternoon train leaves Pima about 5.30. We've still got a few minutes. So you're going too sound to study science, huh? Well, that's what you want, isn't it? That's right, Dad. Well, now, I don't know much about science, son, but I know quite a bit about some other things. I do know the Lord spoke to the prophet and that the gospel is true. I know our gospel believes in truth regardless of its source. Now, I've tried to tell you the way things look to me, and maybe sometimes I've told you things that don't exactly jibe with the truth. But if I have, just discard them. In this church, you don't have to believe anything that isn't true. And if you want to be a scientist's son, you hit it just as hard as you can. Now, you're going to hear some things up there that don't jibe exactly with what you've learned in Sunday school, but don't worry about it. Just keep an open mind, and truth will eventually work its way to the surface. I don't worry about how much you learn. Study all the science you can. And if you'll remember your prayers, and don't be profane, and live in such a way that you will feel comfortable in the company of good people, then Mother and I will feel good about your going. And don't you worry about the gospel, son. It'll stand the test of all truth. I appreciate what you're telling me, Dad, but let's not miss that train. Well, see you later, Jeff. Seems like nowadays these young folks are always in a hurry. <laughs> Come on, son, if it's speed you want, I'll show you how to make this board really rattle. <laughs> Crank it up. Once more. There you go. Come on, boy. Make that train. has instilled a desire to search for truth, that truth which my father mentioned, into our very beings. Man, in his ceaseless search for truth, 
has discovered and partially explored six different worlds. The first of these, that wonderful, practical, everyday world in which we live. A world in which things are measured in feet and inches, seconds and hours and days. Then we have a second world, the world of the biologist, a world that is microscopic, where cells are usually about a ten thousandth of an inch across and may divide every few minutes. Next, we delve into the chemical world of molecules and atoms, where the atoms complete their vibrations in a hundred million millionths of a second. Inside the nucleus of the atom, we enter a fourth world, a world where things are happening millions of times faster still. There is also a fifth world that we are beginning to know, a world of vast distances, where astronomers measure the revolutions of the planets in years, and where the unit of distance used for measurement, the light year, is about six million million miles in length. And finally, there is the spiritual world, where time is measured in eternities, and space is limitless. Thus, in our minds, we can travel from the almost infinitesimally small to the infinitely large. Now, curiously enough, there are good people who would have you believe that man, who understands all these wonderful things and masters them in part, is no more than the dust of the earth to which his body returns. To me, this is inconceivable. Today, the increasing effort to understand man's place in the grand scheme of things proceeds at an accelerated pace. The answer to this problem won't all be found in the laboratory, because many of the most important answers to the question, where did I come from, what am I doing here, and where am I going after death, will be found in the realm of the spiritual. And I don't think many scientists today would presume to say a thing may not be simply because they do not understand it, nor would they deny the validity of spiritual experiences of others because they have been without such experiences themselves. Just as science has proven a help to religion, so religion in its finest expression has given impetus to science. There is no end to the progress of a man who seeks for truth. Death is not the end. It is but one more step in the great forward march made possible by the redemption of the Savior. Of this I am convinced. Through science, man has learned many truths regarding the earth. Truths which have aided him in obeying the divine command to subdue it and make it more livable. But the fact remains that man will never know all the answers to his questions until that day when the Lord shall come, he shall reveal all things, things which have passed and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth, by which it is made, and the purpose and end thereof. Meanwhile, through faith and good works, we can gain a testimony for ourselves that God lives and that Jesus is the Christ, just as men have done from ages past. Many prophets in the ancient scriptures have verified the literal existence of God, for they saw him and talked with him face to face. They have given us witness of their personal experience. The prophet Joseph Smith in our own day also saw and talked with the Father and the Son. He said of Jesus Christ, and now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lived for we saw him even on the right hand of God. And we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God.